Hello, Hal. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Just um, I'm running a smidge late. I apologize for that. I give another minute or two for folks to jump on. I was uh, a 10 o'clock class just went a tad over. So give people a chance to change gears here. How's everybody's weekend? Good morning. Great. It was great. What made it great? Got a, I got a good lead. One of my uh, allied resources contractor, the uh, sister, is going to be looking for a home with her daughter. Standing. So uh, just got to let it germinate. Okay, good. That's good stuff. Anybody else? Who else has had some good stuff this weekend? I think I saw this morning an email. I didn't read it through. I just saw the header real quick from uh, Mary Cano, who's the executive director of the, um, the Board of Realtors that I belong to. Sounds like the governor's lifting of the um, stay-at-home order means that we can now do public open houses again. Is that what you guys have heard? Well, now you've heard it because I got that email this morning. It sounds like we can now do public open houses. We're going to have to adhere to the, um, the guidelines in terms of the size of a gathering. And I think we're going to have to uh, continue to wear masks probably and things like that. But um, that's, that's exciting. I think that's, that's good to be able to kind of get back out there again, right? All right. Hal, Hal do you think he's gonna uh, use the same formula as retail, 50% of square footage, something like that? I don't think so. I think what he's gonna look at it is um, the size of people that you could have at a party. I think it's gonna be more along those lines, probably. But I think as, a, as an agent hosting an open house, I think you're, you're probably as a listing agent working, you know, if you're not the listing agent, working with the listing agent to figure out how many people do you want in there at a time, right? I think you probably are going to have to uh, be more comfortable. And I think people will be understanding of this is that if you have a big group that you're going to limit large numbers of people in the house simultaneously, that you're going to ask people to wait, right? Anyway, we'll talk about open houses on another day, but this is about marketing and prospecting is where we're going to go today. So, Give me a second here, I wanna get the PowerPoint up and I'll get the screen share going. And again, um, just to jump in and let me know that you can see the screen share, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. You got it? Okay, so this is where we are. If you remember, we went out of sequence last week and I apologize for that. When we first started that uh, conversation about validity and positioning on Wednesday, I would have preferred that we moved right into prospecting and marketing, but instead, for some reason, we jumped over and on Friday, we talked about leveraging a database. And um, good topic, but we need to circle back around and connect marketing and prospecting to your, um, to your value statement, right? You know, um, just in, in, and so we're gonna combine these two. These are two different topics that we're gonna combine together. And quite honestly, I think I've set this up to lead with marketing first and then get into prospecting. Um, so that's where we're going today. But tell me the difference between the two in your mind. What's the difference for you and how you understand marketing versus prospecting? Anybody? What's the difference? Somebody's got to know the difference between marketing and prospecting. Any marketing majors? Now, I think it would be... Um you know, from being in the field and being a sales trainer for corporate and you're marketing, you're building that brand, that awareness, spelling out, educating uh, features and benefits and what they can do and identifying the requirements of the client and formulating strategy, meet them. Prospecting is, is like, you know, in the real estate world, I guess you would call the, the actual farming. Yeah. And you know, so, sometimes we refer to farming as a specific kind of prospecting. You know, the, the way I like to, to think about the two is you think about a prospector, right? Think about the gold rush back in the California 1800s. You know, that prospector is kind of sitting along the side of a creek and he's got a pan and he's sifting through the mud and he's, he's getting his hands dirty. He's getting wet. He's getting muddy. And he's actually sifting through an awful lot of muck in the hopes that he's going to find a nugget of gold, right? And there's a lot of muck to find any muck, any, any nugget there. But the idea of prospecting is it's much more hands-on, it's much more active, whereas marketing is, is kind of that brand idea. How do you tell the story of your brand, right? Uh, when we went back to Wednesday, when we were starting to think about who am I looking for? What makes me uniquely qualified? What is my brand? 
once you get a sense of that, how are you going to tell that story? And, and that story is a marketing story. And uh, we will sometimes market our businesses. We will sometimes market our inventory. But prospecting is much more the hands-on action of reaching out and touching folks. And so there's this puzzle that we sometimes talk about uh, from a branding standpoint, what makes you memorable and valid? And, um, you know, that's the conversation that we started on Wednesday, right? Two ways to build your reputation. You can market your unique selling proposition and you can deliver your unique selling proposition through your great customer service. Those are ways to build reputation. Um, anything can be part of your brand, you know, um, for example, I have seen uh, years ago, there was a guy who was a luxury agent in uh, Somerset County. It was, uh, he, he worked in sort of this horse country uh, kind of area. And one of the things that was kind of unique is um, every time he did a public open house, and typically his properties were, were high-end luxury homes, every time he did a public open, he dressed in a tuxedo. And when you came to the open, there he was in full tux and tails, and that kind of became part of his brand. You know, and it got included into some of the, the visual stuff that he would put in his marketing material. Um, there are uh, people who sometimes include their, their, um, their accent. There's a couple very um, well-known British agents that do business in Bergen County Partners, uh, or Bergen County, rather. Do you guys know any of them? Sheldon Neal is one. Do you guys know Sheldon? And Sheldon has actually incorporated his accent into, into his branding, right? As the British agent. Um, hey, George, how are you? Just wanted to tell you, if I saw you online, I drove past a house in Harding yesterday that you had sold. Congratulations, dude. That was a nice thing. Thank you. I thought of you this morning. I was out in Westfield showing another house. Ah, good deal. Well, yeah, you're right here in my backyard. Yeah, so close. Um, so look, anything can be part of your brand. The one of the things that you want to start thinking about in terms of your branding and your marketing is it's really important to start to think about consistency. And I think we, uh, we touch on this is your, your unique brand, your unique selling proposition, your style, all those things, how it fits into a target audience, all that stuff is critical. One of the things that you don't want to have happen is for your brand to get um, fragmented. And what I mean by that is, um, Sometimes I see people change it up on different platforms. For example, the, the things that they put on their for sale signs don't carry through on their website. The images that they use on their website don't carry through on their social media accounts. Their images and things that they use or the color schemes that they use in those things don't carry through onto their business cards. And what happens is it's kind of a mishmash of things. One of the things that you want to start thinking about is is what do I want my brand to look and feel like? Um, and then how do I put that out there? And once you've made decisions about things like, as, as important as, as even color palette, if I wanted to have a brand, and I was, I was talking to somebody over the weekend who uh, had a logo created and he wanted uh, some feedback on the logo. If I wanted to have a brand that, that denoted um, a strong, powerful, luxury kind of a presence. Let's just start with things like colors. What color palette would I choose from if I wanted to communicate strength and luxury? What Red. color palettes? White, gold. Red. Reds, golds, bold colors, right? If I wanted a color palette that was a little bit softer and maybe a little bit more approachable, what colors would I be looking into? Blues, grays. Yeah, blues and greens and softer. And, 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 and so all that stuff is stuff that you want to think about right now. We, we give you the flexibility here at Keller Williams to change it up. You can, you can create your own logos. You can create your own things, your own color schemes. You can't alter the KW stuff, right? When you've got a Keller Williams logo that you've downloaded, you can't go to Canva and change the colors, right? Nothing makes me crazier as a diehard Yankee fan than to see people walking around with powder blue Yankee hats. I mean, it just makes me freaking nuts, but that's just me. That's my issue. You, but you can create, if powder blue is a color that you want, you can create those color palettes on your own. Things like font, right? If I wanted to, uh, again, go back to communicate um, strength and power and luxury and, uh, and whatever, you know, what kinds of fonts would I choose? Well, 
probably things that have more sort of straight angular lines. Softer fonts that are kind of more curvy and more scripty kind of create a different feel. All that stuff mm -hmm. I thought about, but once you've thought about it, it should carry through on everything. Don't have it different on your website from your business card and your business card from your for sale sign. All of it has to come together because ultimately what has to happen is that people want to have enough saturation of seeing your stuff that when they see it quickly, they recognize what they're looking at, right? I'll give you an example of that and how it played out for a company I used to work for. I started in 2003 for Weikert Realtors. Um, and uh, grew up in Morris Plains where Weikert is headquartered. My mother's older sister was a uh, gym secretary uh, years and years ago. And so uh, it just seemed like when I started, Weikert was the company to start for because that's where everybody was connected that I knew, right? And the story goes that Jim started that company in Chatham, New Jersey. And if you go there today, there's still his first sales office is still on that main street in Chatham. And it's a deep property about 300 feet back. And one of the things that Jim did early on is he wanted to try to get a sense of what color schemes were going to be the most legible for his for sale signs. And so he had all kinds of different templates set up with for sale signs. And he put those all the way in the garage at the back of the property, 300 feet away from the street. He got all his team, his sales office to come out on the street and to look down the driveway and decide which sign was the most legible. And um, no surprise, the colors that they chose were yellow and black which is that color combination, which is super legible. It's why we use it on uh, hazard signs and it's why we use it on school buses and we use it so much. But what happens now is, tell me if, if you've had this experience, but what happens at least for me is when I'm driving around the corner and I see a yellow and black sign way up the road, even before I can read the letters with these old eyes, I know whose brand it is because it's yellow and black, right? To some degree, that's kind of what you're aiming for. When you're driving down the highway and you see a billboard that's blue with a big old head on it, you know who I'm talking about. And it's Rob. And it's RobSellsNJ.com. And we've seen it enough times. So the point of the matter is consistently. When you decide what it looks like, carry it through consistently. Don't chop it up and have it different, right? And think about what's going to be the most resonant with your audience. We talked about who you're looking for. Now we're going to, you know, think a little bit about what that looks like in terms of color, in terms of design. And if you're not familiar with this, what I would say is it's probably worth spending a couple of bucks to get some input with somebody who, who understands this at a high level and just kind of get it right, right out of the gate. Um, all right. Analyze your style. What makes you memorable? Um, your personality, um, all that stuff come into play. Now, I'm looking for this marketing and prospecting. Here's what I'm looking for. Our businesses need to be prospecting based, right? They need to be prospecting based, but marketing enhanced. And, and what does that mean to you? Marketing enhanced, but prospecting based. What, is, what does that mean in real terms? Anybody? What does that mean? Target marketing. All right, we're going to talk about target marketing, but the idea of being prospecting based, but enhanced by your marketing, how does marketing enhance your prospecting? Any thoughts? So we're, we have to be in the business of always getting our hands dirty to find new, new uh, customers, potential customers, and your marketing is there to um, nurture that the process. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, you know, it can nurture it in a lot of different ways. Your marketing can give you a reason to prospect. Um, anybody have an idea of how your marketing could actually give you a reason to prospect? Anybody? If you have a target audience and maybe you know exactly who you are looking for, so it's easier to know where, how to move forward. Okay, here's, here's what I'm thinking about that in terms of marketing enhancing a couple different ways. One is I could send out a marketing piece. Like if I was George, I would be sending a marketing piece in Harding because you're under contract or just recently sold that one, right? Yeah. I would tell that story in Harding. And if you drive around that neighborhood, these are really, really affluent homes. 
And if you send that marketing piece out, what happens is it gives you a reason to prospect and follow up because then it becomes, hey, did you get the marketing piece that I sent you? It gives you a reason to call, right? Um, the other thing that it does is it makes your brand um, less of a stranger, right? We've touched on this in some other classes, this idea of, of the mere exposure effect, that simply being exposed to the marketing piece again and again and again, what begins to happen is that through repetition, we begin to develop a sense of comfort with something. And through repetition, at some point, that comfort actually turns into a preference. And, um, and, and great marketers understand that. That's why they hit you again and again and again and again and again, because if they're in front of you enough times, you're going to develop a preference for the thing that they have. And so the way that your marketing enhance your prospecting is that if they've seen your message a lot and then you show up for real, when you show up, you're not going to trigger the same old, I don't like salesperson biases that everybody else is going to. Human beings have this, this aversion to salespeople, right? But they won't have an aversion to you because you seem like a friend. You seem like someone that they know. You seem like somebody that they already have a connection with because they've seen your marketing enough times, right? That's the reason why we've got to try to pick a geographic area. And uh, uh, later on this week, I think we're going to get into farming, geographic base, because you can't saturate, you don't have the, the, the ability to saturate a huge, huge area unless you've got a massive budget. Right? I don't know what Rob is paying to be on every train and every bus and every billboard, but it's a lot of money. For most of us, we don't have that kind of a budget. So we've got to pick a smaller space and come through with multiple different marketing channels again and again and again so that when I show up in my prospecting efforts, whether that prospecting is by phone, by door knocking, by uh, networking or whatever it is, I'm less of a stranger. So it's prospecting and marketing together. Um, I think somebody's got uh, a cricket in the background or either that or there's a bird outside my window. I don't know if I can mute that out if you're all hearing it. But, it's me. Uh, it's me. I'll, I'll, I'll mute. Okay. It's Marta. Yeah, I'll mute. Okay. All right. You can unmute later when you want to jump back okay. in. Okay. Um, prospecting is seeking leads. Marketing is attracting leads, right? That's kind of the, the difference. Now, we're going to market and prospect together. We're going to prospect remember uh on on friday we talked about the database and we had this sort of concentric rings like a bullseye and on the outer ring are people that you don't even know yet but they fit the profile of somebody that you'd like to know and so you're going to market to that person to try to get them to raise their hand and to some degree you're also going to prospect to that person the difference is that if you're prospecting to the haven't met, you're going to show up as a stranger. If your marketing precedes it, you're going to show up as, as someone who's known and have less resistance. You can prospect and market to both the people that you haven't got a relationship with yet and the people that you do, but the people that you do have a relationship is ultimately where we're going to cultivate those relationships over time and try to get the appointments. Prospecting based marketing enhanced. We talked about that a minute ago. Prospecting reinforces your marketing marketing supports your prospecting, right? Um, there's a cost. And one of the things we always have to weigh out is this balance of, of money and time. Because those are the only two things we've got to invest. We can either invest our money or we can invest our dollars. And in the beginning of an agent's business, most of us don't bring a war chest of dollars into the business and have the bandwidth and the capacity to market your way in to success. Um, some people do. Um, I had an opportunity years ago to hire an agent who was a television network executive. And uh, in her mid fifties, she took a buyout program from her network where she had a senior position and it was a massive buyout, uh, probably honestly more money than she and her family could spend in the next two generations of her family's life. And so she came in with this huge, huge uh, six, seven, eight figure, eight figure budget. <laughs> and it's a lot of money. And she wasn't spending it all on marketing or even all on real estate, but that's what her bio was. And so she came in and she said, look, I want to catch up quick. And so I'm going to spend tens of thousands of dollars a month to saturate through marketing to get known in the target market that I want to do business in. If you've got that kind of a budget, yay for you, most of us don't. What we have is time. 
what we have is we've got a all is our time and at some point by investing our time and doing marketing that's lower cost and showing up and prospecting over time we bring the revenue in and then we can maybe you know increase the marketing expense the the things that not all marketing has to cost money we're going to talk about that in a minute but a lot of it does and so try to be as leveraged and someone had mentioned target marketing before try to make sure that any dollars that you're spending to tell your brand story or that you're marketing to market your inventory is going to get into the client base that's most apt to respond to it, right? Once you know who your target audience is that you're looking for and you learn how to tell the story that they're gonna to wanna to hear, you don't wanna tell that story to the wrong people. And that's why um, targeted lists are better than broad lists. You know, um, a lot of people use, direct mail, and I am a fan of direct mail if it's used properly, because a lot of people don't use it anymore. And, and one of my feelings is that if people aren't doing it, it's probably the right time to start doing it. And you don't see lots, at least in my market, you don't see lots and lots of realtors using direct mail. Those that do, I think, do it many times the wrong way. And what I mean that is they, they go on this service called Everyday Direct, which is a service of the US Postal Service where you can get a mail piece and send it out to everyone along the letter carrier's route at a much discounted cost. Um, some unique things about that system is while it's cheaper per piece, the pieces are these weird sizes, right? Have you ever seen the everyday direct pieces? Sometimes they're the real big ones that are kind of the size of a placemat that's kind of jammed into your mailbox when you get there. Those are the everyday direct pieces and everybody on the letter carrier's route are getting it. Well, I can assure you that everybody on your letter carrier's route doesn't meet the targeted demographic of who you were trying to find. And so that's just not as efficient as going to some of our vendor partners, right? Prism Digital is one of them. We've got reps that work with our Bergen County offices. I know that in the Ridgewood office, you guys even have one of our Prism reps right on site. Does anybody know who the Prism rep is in the Ridgewood office? Anybody want to unmute? And or put it's, in uh, chat. It's Mr. Mike. What's his last name? Uh, I call him Mr. Mike. Mike uh, K. Okay, and he's your Prism rep. Yes. Okay, cool. Very good. And what Prism will do is they'll let you buy a target list. If you decide, for example, let's say that I wanted to, um, I'll give you this example. When I was in Montclair, um, there's this phenomenon that happens in Montclair, and when your last kid graduates high school. What happens a lot of times is people sell that home because they're not using the school system anymore. They sell that home and they don't move far, but they're moving into a lower tax based community. Montclair is a great town. It's a cool town. It's got a lot going for it, but the taxes are really high, even by Essex County standards. And so a lot of times what happens is somebody sells the Montclair home and they move to Verona or they move not far, but just out of that tax base. And so if you know that that's the phenomenon that happens when the youngest kid graduates high school, it's probably good to start targeting people who live in Montclair, who've got children who are about high school age where the youngest child might be somewhere around junior year. Can we peg that at about 16? Um, and believe it or not, you can purchase lists that have that ability. You can't do that on social anymore through Facebook. You know, Facebook got sued by HUD for fair housing violations because they were accused of allowing people to do advertising to, to specific groups that violated the fair housing practices. Um, but the print shops can still target these lists. So you could go to Mike or to somebody at Prism and say, show me everybody in this geographic footprint and I want people who have kids where the youngest kid would probably be about 16 years old. And I probably want people who didn't just move in, who've been in the house for a while. NAR says that the average homeowner moves about every 10 years. So being in a home maybe seven years might be a first cut in terms of those people I'd want to look for. So if you're in the home of about seven years, your youngest kid's about 16 years old, those might be people that I'm going to selectively pull that list. And what you're not going to get is a single letter carrier route. You're going to get three people on that street, two people over here, seven people the block behind. 
But once you buy that list, now you can create your marketing piece that you believe is going to hit the high notes that matter to them and send it just to that list. And if you're going to spend money on marketing, I think targeted marketing like that makes more sense, right? Does anybody have any targeted lists that they've already purchased? It's cheaper than you think to buy that list. I was working with an agent a couple years ago that I was coaching privately and um, they had a, the, what they wanted to do is they wanted to build a geographic farm of about 800 people. And they had a very precise target of who they were looking for. And they did, they actually went to prism and they pulled that list and they refined that list. They didn't have the dollars yet in their business to market to all 800 at once. And the, the rule of marketing is, is it's kind of a consistent, you've got to do it again and again and again, right? Marketing is about saturation of getting people familiar through repetition. And if you just do it once, it's not going to be enough. If you just do it a couple of times, it's not going to be enough. She didn't have the money to market to all 800, but she wanted that list. And so she started out with 100. And as she grew more income, she bumped it up from 100 to 200 and then to 300. And then ultimately she built it out, but she built it out by adding people that she had already purchased the target for and just added into that group, right? Does that make sense? And I'd consider you thinking about what targets make sense for your business, right? All right. Al, Al, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Just wanted to correct myself. Uh, it's Mr. Bill Grzynski. I thought and, it was uh, and I sat, yeah, I sat with Bill um, in March before the office shut down, and uh, it was a little overwhelming. It was kind of drinking from a fire hose. Yeah, but he could really pinpoint. He gave many examples, and his desk is right there at the uh, office. I don't know if there's any other prison rep prison representatives in the other offices. I don't think you know. I don't think the other offices are are big enough in terms of agent count to support having a desk there. But Bill will work with anyone. And uh, Bill Clark is actually the rep that I've used for PRISM for years. He kind of introduced PRISM into Bergen Counties a number of years ago. Um, he's based out here. Actually, PRISM is in Mountainside, not too far from where I live. Um, but my point is, they're one of the companies that will actually let you buy the list from them. There's lots of companies, print companies especially, that will help you figure out the list, but they want to keep the list and just have you send stuff to it. I want you to own the list. And Prism is one of the ones that for a price will let you buy that list. I think when, when uh, the agent that I was working with bought that list of 800 names, I think it cost her like a hundred something bucks, not a lot. But for a hundred bucks, now she knew exactly who she wanted, where they were, what their names were, what their address was, in many instances, what their telephone and phone numbers were. So she didn't only have the ability to, to mail stuff, but she could knock on their doors. She could send emails as well. Owning the list is, is really important, right? And, and Prism will let you do it. Um, anyway, it's Bill. So reach out to Bill. Hal. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, some of that information, you can get it in Remind, right? Some of it you can. Remind yeah. is a great resource. Uh, some of it you can probably even get in RPR. The challenge though is to, is to download it into a useful format that you can use like a spreadsheet. It's, it's harder to get, in my experience, out of Remind. Whereas if you go to Bill or, or these companies, they'll, they'll just refine this list and then you can just export it as a spreadsheet, which now you, you have and you can do with it as you want, right? Okay. All right, let's get back into marketing and lead gen. Here's the, the, the formula that they put into the, uh, the lead gen class. And again, it's this notion of how they support each other. Um, I'm not a baker. Anybody in this room a baker? I'm a griller. I'm a barbecue guy. I don't like baking uh, because baking is way too precise for me. There's way too much chemistry involved in baking. You know, when I cook, if I don't like an ingredient, I just leave it out. Or if I like a good ingredient, I might add it, more of it in or swap it with something else. You can't really do that when you're baking. You can't say, I don't really like baking powder, so I'm not going to put it in you're not going to have a good result if you don't use everything. And the recipe here, the way that we want you to think about marketing and prospecting and the way they interact with each other is a little bit like baking bread. And so in the imagery here, if you look at it, the, 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 the people that you have in your database, those that you know already and those that you don't kind of become the flower. And then what you need to do is you need to start to put in 
a little bit of an activating ingredient. You need to add the water and the yeast. Prospecting and marketing work together the way that water and yeast work together. If you put the yeast in without the warm water, nothing happens. If you put the warm water in without the yeast, you don't get a rise. And so you've got to do both of them together. And then the key is temperature. What makes bread bake and rise is the gas that's formed when the yeast and the water combined in a warmer temperature, it creates the gas that causes the bread to rise up. And in our model, the prospecting and the marketing are the activated ingredient. Time is the habit, is the temperature. Doing it over time is what causes your business to grow. And at the end of this, if you're baking, you get a nice piece of bread. And the imagery here is you have a nice sustainable business. Your database, the activating ingredients over time, right? Just an interesting image, thought we'd share. Um, all right, I wanna to move to some myths and some truths. Truth, the role of marketing during your growth phase of your business is to support your prospecting. Um, we've talked about these benefits before. Here's what I wanted, the myths and truths. Myth number one, only need to do one or the other. There are so many coaches out there. The only thing that they teach and talk about is prospecting. Lead generation is prospecting, 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 prospecting. And I'm going to tell you, your bread won't rise without the yeast. Your business won't grow to the extent that it could. Now, there's nothing wrong with flatbread. I love flatbread. But if you're really trying to build a nice, crusty loaf of bread, you got to have the yeast. If you want to have a really successful business, you've got to focus on the marketing. In fact, I would suggest that a lead generation time block include marketing and prospecting in it. And, and here's what I would say. If you were going to have three hours to do your lead generation in, here's the way I might structure that. I would probably structure the first, um, I would probably structure the first part of your time block, maybe the first half hour or 40 minutes to focus on your marketing activities first before you start on your prospecting. Why do you think that would be true? Why would I say start with marketing and not prospecting? Anybody have a thought around that? You can just unmute or put it in chat. Why you think I might say start with the marketing? Well, here's why, I'll tell you. What I know is that for most of us, the act of lead generating is not the thing that we look forward to most in our day. To kind of block out that time, and I don't care whether it's a one hour block, a half hour block, a three hour block, whatever it is, our lead generation time block is not usually, for most of us, the most fun part of our day. And there's some resistance to doing it. And so what I want to do is I want to start by building momentum. I want to start by building momentum by doing the easy thing first. And for most of us, working on our marketing is easier than doing the prospecting. We've got to be prospecting based. The bigger part of that block has to be prospecting. But I like to start with the marketing first because it's easier to get going on and it's easier to get started and it gets me moving, right? It helps me build momentum. Now be careful. Because once you get into a groove, it's real easy to just stay marketing and not do prospecting. You need to do both. But the first part of the time block would be probably a half an hour or so of marketing. And then I would change gears for about 15 minutes and I would do what? I would practice my scripts. What scripts would I practice? Well, it depends on what my prospecting task is going to be that day. If my prospecting is to host an open house, then I'm probably going to practice my open house scripts. If my task is going to be prospecting through networking events, I'm going to practice my elevator speech. If my, if my task is going to be FISBO calls, I'm going to practice those scripts. But whatever your prospecting activity is going to be, I would practice for about 15 or 20 minutes the scripts that support that task. So we start with marketing, then do some script practice, and then the big chunk of time, probably 50% of your block is going to be actually doing that prospecting. But you've also got to leave just a little bit of time, maybe a 15 minute to a half an hour block on the, on the end of that block to update your database. Because as things change, and we might have talked about this on Fridays, as you uncover more information through your prospecting efforts, you've got to go back and add those changes into your database. You're going to not get back to it later on. You're going to think you will. You're going to say, I'm going to dedicate some time on Friday to go back and do all my notes. No, you're not going to do it. So, so we got to do prospecting and marketing if you're going to be successful. And I would encourage you to spend a little bit of time 
doing each one in each, in each uh, time block, right? Myth number two, the purpose of prospecting is in marketing is to uh, get appointments. And the truth is appointments come, um, they come through nurturing a relationship over time. They come out of nurturing your pipeline. The purpose of prospecting and marketing is to get an appointment if you can, but the real thing that you wanna do is you wanna add your database. You wanna get more people into your database. Tim Heil, uh, some of you may know his name, H-E-Y-L is his last name spelling. He's a, uh, a big shot agent out of uh, Texas. Uh, his business was based in Austin. Uh, he's got expansion teams in a lot of Southern cities. He's probably now maybe early thirties, I think. The National Association of Realtors named him one of the top uh, 30 under 30 in the nation years ago. And one of the things that we, we brought Tim out to one of our Bergen County partners um, uh, rallies where we had everybody, all the market centers together. And we brought Tim out a couple years ago. And one of the things that he said that was really, really telling is his business changed when the focus of his lead generation time block moved away from finding appointments and moved to finding what he called nurtures, meaning if I, can, if I find somebody that needs to meet with me right now, that's great, that's gravy. But what I really want is to uncover people who are willing to let me stay in touch with them over time. Because if I can add a certain number of people to my database every single day who are gonna let me stay in touch with them over time, what he called a nurture, then I know that the act of nurturing them is gonna cause the appointment to materialize when it's time for them. If my lead generation effort is focused on finding the nurtures, my system will create the appointments. If my lead generation is only looking for the appointment, I'm gonna to throw too many fish back into the water, right? That was a massive aha for me at least because that's when his business exploded. And I want you to think about that yourself. A good day of lead generation is a day that you've added more people to your database. Working your database will make the appointments show up. Make sense? Okay. Myth number three, any marketing I do builds mindshare. No, right? It's, it's time on task over time. It's marketing over time. The mistake that I made early on when I wasted a lot of money is that I didn't have, uh, I didn't have a big enough budget to market to the size audience that I intended to market to. And uh, what happened was I did it for a number of months and then I didn't have enough income to support it and I had to cut back. And, and that just was a waste of money. You're better off doing, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, start small to what you can afford. And as you've got revenue, build it out, build it out, build it out. The same holds true even with Facebook ads. I've seen a lot of times where people put too much money into their budget for social ads on Facebook and Instagram, and they may be spending $20 a day only to find out that after a few weeks time, it's too expensive to sustain and they've wasted all that money right? Marketing builds mindshare if you do it in a systematic way that you can afford to do it consistently over time, right? Everything else is wasted money. Now, question. How, go ahead. Uh, so how often do you recommend to like be in touch? Every uh, two weeks, every month? Well, the, the model is 19 touches to connect when you've got somebody in your database who hasn't started a two-way conversation. The model would suggest 19 times a year, which is uh, once a month, 12 months a year, and then a handful of other things throughout the course of the year. But once you've got two-way communication going, the model would suggest 36 times a year, three times, three times a month. The question is, what percentage of those touches are going to be free, and what percentage of those touches are you going to have a budget to use? you really in the growth phase of your business want to make as many of those three times a month, 36 times a year touches freebies, meaning, you know, I'm going to do it through email. Again, I've got two way communication here so I can email, I can text, I can pick up the phone. I could put a post or a direct message on your Facebook page or Instagram account without having to advertise to get to you because I already have a relationship with you you will periodically spend money to put something in the mail or spend money to do it another way, but it's really three times a month, right? Now, marketing your brand. Here's the thing. Marketing your brand is what you do to attract sellers. Marketing your listings is what you do to attract buyers. And there's a place to do both. Your brand marketing 
are all the things that we talked about earlier that include things like your style and include things like your, your messaging. Um, you're trying to market your brand to attract sellers. And uh, for many people, one of the very effective ways that they do that is through even things like a YouTube channel where they set up a YouTube channel and they have a consistent message that maybe they talk about things like once a month, a quick report on what's going on in your community in terms of housing. And believe me, you don't have to make this super polished. You don't have to overthink it. It's, it's opening up your Zoom camera or getting out your phone and turning it on video and facing yourself and just, just ad living. Just have a couple of notes in front of you. And it can be something as simple as, hey, it's Hal uh, from Keller Williams Realty. And I just wanted to give you an update on what's going on in Westfield, New Jersey in the month of May. What we saw was that listings were down from the same period last year, but up from the month of April, which indicates to us that perhaps sellers are getting a little bit more comfortable with the idea of being on the market during a pandemic. Whatever it is, right? It doesn't have to be long. It shouldn't be long. It just has to be something that you communicate information that they think is relevant and interesting through a channel that they go to. And you're beginning to brand yourself as the market expert. Gary Keller says all the time that what you want to do is you want to position and brand yourself as the market economist of choice in your market, the local economist of choice, rather, in your market. You want to be the one who gives them the data. And you want to do it consistently. And... You also want to be the one who gives them other stuff that's useful and that's not real estate related. You know, Brian Buffini, who, if you don't know Buffini, one of the great real estate trainers that I really, really love, he's the guy who really, really started to focus on building a um, business by referral. And um, he talks about, he's got a, a program that twice a month, they'll send out stuff for you. Again, you got to pay for it, uh, but one of the pieces is a real estate related piece and one of the pieces is not. And the real estate related piece is going to be hyper local market information that positions you as the expert. The other piece could be just something interesting that people are like, huh, that's interesting. I'm glad I knew that. Like, I mean, one piece was about, look it up, excuse me, on my phone, I got a crack in my screen on my phone. Well, if you cracked your phone, how could you get that fixed? Or if you dropped your phone in a tub of water and it, and it got wet, what do you do to dry it out? That's, that, that kind of stuff is actually a piece that he would send out. It has nothing to do with real estate, but it's a useful tidbit that somebody could find as useful. A um, couple of years ago, I gave to one of my coaching clients the idea of sending out as a marketing piece, how do you contact the state of New Jersey unclaimed property department and find out whether or not there's any funds that are there. And, and uh, you know, periodically, I, I would recommend that everybody do that. You just go to the, the right website. You will have to cough up your social security number. But the state of New Jersey uh, is the final depositing spot for lots and lots of funds that people don't know how to find you. For example, if you've got a bank account that sits dormant for too long, uh, especially a business bank account, um, if it sits dormant for too long, the bank closes the account. And if they don't know how to find you, they just send the money to the state and says to the state, you figure out how to find them. Well, long story short is this, uh, this agent had, had sent out a touch that said, hey, check this out. See if you, you, you have anything there. You can thank me later. Well, sure enough, a couple of calls came in later from two or three different people who said, you know, I'll be damned, but I contacted the property department and I found that there was a $400 account that I had closed somewhere and it was still sitting there. They had lost track of me because I had moved and they sent the check to me and I just got $400. Thank you. That was really good. <laughs> I appreciate you for that, right? That's the kind of stuff. Marketing can be lots of different things, but you're marketing your brand when you're to, to attract sellers. You're marketing your listings to attract the buyers. And that's where social, I think, really does excel it's easier to use social to market your listings uh, than, than virtually any other source in terms of dollars, you know, for marketing. But your listings attract the buyers. And once you've got the buyers, now you've got a reason to talk to the sellers. To some extent, it's that circle, right? My marketing attracted the buyer. Now I've got these buyers. And so I'm going to work with these buyers through my prospecting to find inventory. It's just how it kind of works. So, um, you know, decide on how you're going to how you're gonna build this out for yourself, but recognize that if you need more buyers, you're gonna market your listings. If you need more sellers, you're gonna to start to market your brand. 
but time is slower for brand marketing. It takes more time. It takes more time to establish. It takes more dollars to establish. It's faster and easier to get in the pathway of buyers through marketing. So methods for marketing your brand, community involvement. Who can give me some examples of ways that you can get involved in your community as a way of enhancing your brand? Any ideas? We just had Red Day. That was one. What oh, else? Here. Just uh, yeah. <clears throat> volunteer. Just volunteer. Yeah. Where else? What, where would you volunteer? Meals on Wheels. To do that, right? Uh, I saw Mike Gerbino. I don't know if he's on this call or not, but I saw Mike Gerbino over the weekend on his Facebook feed sort of showing that he was involved in uh, collecting food for a charitable organization, right? That's getting involved. And when people see you, as a, not just a realtor who's looking to sell homes, but somebody who's giving back to the community, it's a really good thing. I've seen sometimes agents set up collection sites of uh, canned goods at a supermarket, right? That's the kind of thing we're talking about. We're talking about getting involved in charities. We're talking about all that stuff. Media, marketing your brand through the media. We talked about YouTube and things like that. Mail outs we've talked about. Your signage. How does your signage speak about your brand? Well, to some extent, what's on your sign, right? The signs can sometimes get a little too cluttered. I don't think you need too much stuff on the sign, but you do need to have, you know, it has to say, you know, whatever your company name is, if you're gonna put your picture on it, great. Not a huge fan of putting websites on a sign. Most people I don't think are gonna stop and take that down. Um, the thing that's important with signs is they should look good. They should be clean. They should be properly installed. There's nothing that hurts your brand more than to have one of those post signs hanging at a 35 degree angle, right? It just looks like you don't care, right? And so I would spend the money personally to, to have one of the companies that will put the post in the ground, hang the sign for you. And when you're done, they'll come out, take the post out. They keep the posts. I would probably budget for that because that's always gonna look good. It's always gonna look professional. At some point, your signs need to be replaced when they start getting dinged up and when they start getting rusty. And if somebody's shot with a shotgun, you got to get that fixed, right? Because it speaks to your message. It speaks to your brand. Automated marketing, right? The things that you send out through command, right? Through the, the email touches, right? The internet, all that stuff, methods for marketing your brand. Now, what else are people doing for brand marketing? Anything else that people are doing for brand marketing that we haven't touched on here? How about these little giveaways, right? This is Scott Leaf. Maybe he's backwards, right? Pens, giveaways, uh, little pinchy clips for, for bags, all that stuff. That's all brand marketing, right? Okay. Marketing principles. Research your new market method that's in your area. Um, what you want to do is if you've got a new idea, to some extent you want to see, is anybody doing it already? Right. Um, you may want to talk to a team leader or some other folks to sort of see what's being done in the area. Um, I, I'll give you an example of that. Um, I think it's really important to a good tool from a brand marketing standpoint, as Gary says, is to be the local economist of choice is to create information that talks about what happened in the previous month or what happened in the previous quarter. We had this many new listings, we had this many under contracts, et cetera. And an agent had wanted to do that in a market that she was trying to do business in, but she said, the downside is the number one agent in the market is already doing that. Everybody is already getting that marketing piece and that's the marketing piece that I wanted to send. And so we, we, we played with other ideas. One was, could you talk about other data points? Could you talk about trends and other things that maybe she wasn't talking about. What we settled on though is, could you communicate that message through a different channel? She was doing direct mail. This agent did it through a YouTube channel and it worked really, really well because it wasn't more of the same. It was trying to provide uh, the information in a unique and different way, right? So, so think about that. What's being done? Who's already doing it? Is there anybody doing it? And if so, how would I change it up, right? Um, we talked about community involvement, sponsorship, charities. Um, are we going to have Little League this year? I hope so. I miss baseball. 
But, you know, sponsoring a team can be a way to get involved, right? Lots of different things you can do. Um, personally, thank the sponsors, right? It, for people who are getting involved in your activities, when you've got sponsors for activities, for example, um, people who make donations to your, your, um, your gift, uh, your, your canned goods drive, right? Personally, thank the bigger sponsors before, during, after the event, but make sure that you thank everyone who is supporting what you're doing in the community, who's supporting your brand. Um, you know, you may want to become um, an announcer for an event if you don't want to host the, the event yourself and take care of all the different things. You may want to just be the MC uh, and getting involved in that way. You can get involved in the community by writing pieces in local newspapers. You know, newspapers, believe it or not, still exist. Um, my wife actually um, is one of the few people that reads a newspaper every single day, cover to cover. And she does it on paper. And it's funny. When you go out on a recycling day, which you, you find out two really interesting things. One is nobody reads newspapers anymore. And a lot of people drink a lot more than you think. Those are the two things you find on a recycling day. But the point is there's newspapers that still exist. And a lot of times they exist online in hyper-local forums like in our community that's called TAP, Tap Into Westfield, Tap Into Ridgewood. There's other forums called The Patch, right? And sometimes these small online forums are always looking for someone to be a real estate contributor to tell the stories. And this isn't to go out there and hawk your business. This isn't for you to go out there and say how great you are. This is for you to provide that information. Here's what's going on. Here's trends that we're seeing. Here's how things have changed post you know, COVID-19. Or here's how we expect things to shift back once we start to open things up, right? If you can be the contributor and become that trusted person, those are really great things to do as well. What else are you guys thinking or, or seeing that people are doing from a marketing, a brand marketing standpoint? What does the piece look like? Be consistent. Placement matters. There's an agent that I know in one of our market centers who's actually from another country. And um, believe it or not, she has a very strong business with international investors. And, and she's actually hired someone to write marketing pieces in her country of origin in publications that are, that are read by investors. And she is the, 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 the basically the, the story goes out in her name, even though she's hired someone else to write it. And she's got lots of international investors that see that piece and contact her when they're looking to invest in New York City and the surrounding areas, right? Lots of different ways to think about how to, how to do leverage around that. Mail outs we touched on, include uh, an offer and response, meaning uh, a call to action. Every one of your marketing pieces should invite someone to take some action. A marketing piece that just gives information is good, but a marketing piece that gives information and then asks people to act on that information is better, right? So who can give me an idea of a good call to action that you've seen in a marketing piece? What's a common call to action that we use in this real estate industry? The uh, comparative market analysis. Find out what your house is worth. Yeah. Reach out to me today. I think that one's getting a little tired. It's old. It's old. But, yeah. uh, but what I do see is that sometimes people change it up a little bit. I think people can go online now and get reasonable online valuations. But, but one of the things I have seen people do is, for example, to uh, find out what your home is worth as it relates to your tax assessment for a tax appeal could be a really good thing. A friend of mine in, in the Montclair market where I said people are taxed heavily, uh, one of the things every year is when the, there's a window of time when you can, when you can challenge your tax assessment. And, and she routinely sends out mailers inviting people to say, if you think that your property taxes are too high, and who doesn't, find out what your home is really worth as it relates to its assessed value and see if you've got a legitimate case to have an appeal. That's a service that she provides and that call to action is really relevant in that Montclair market. She gets, she gets lots of business every year simply through that because the call to action is really precise, right? So think about that and what strategically would work for you guys. Uh, we touched on signs, make sure they're in good repair, make sure the message Matches the content. Make sure your sign is legible. 
don't crowd it with too much stuff. We don't need your name and your website and your office phone number and your cell phone number and a QR code and all that stuff. It's just too busy. Right. What people really need to see is sign for sale in one reliable way, preferably your phone number to get to you. And what's the marketing rule in New Jersey that says if your cell phone number is on a sign, who else's number has to be on there? Your broker, right? Your company sign. Yeah. So yes. just make sure, you know, what you can do is um, if it's too crowded, you know, to put it all on that one sign, you could put your cell phone number as a writer and put it on the signpost itself or whatever it is. But if there's any phone numbers on there, your office's number has to be on there as well. And they have to be labeled which one is which, right? But make sure your signs are legible. Automated marketing, super inexpensive. We do that through command, through smart plans. Lots and lots of things that you can start to set up those smart plans in advance with a delay to the next step and just keep that running, right? That automation just works really, really well. Um, you have to give the content that the public wants, right? Um, and again, think about what that looks like from the interest of your target group. Um, you have to make sure that the stuff that, you, that you're gonna um, use on your website is findable. For example, one of the really good marketing techniques if you've got a website is to put the link to your website in your email signature. Every email that goes out, there's a hyperlink in it that says to visit my website, click here. If you've got uh, some you know, other information that you think is useful, like a, um, a neighborhood report of some sort, again, you, you've gotta make sure that you can get that out there in a way that people are gonna find it, right? Advertising and social is one good way to do that, right? One good way to do that. Click here to download the report, and then if we use a, a lead generation capture uh, ad, we're going to pull them into our database as well, right? All right, marketing your listings are a little bit different, right? Marketing your listings are all about creating kind of an emotional reaction, right? It's about creating exposure and urgency. And, you know, one of the things that we look at all the different tools that people use to get, to get that out there website, real estate agent, most, uh, most methods don't work uh, consistently to sell homes that most marketing will bring you buyer business. The way your home sells is not typically through, um, through online marketing and things like that. What you're doing with the online marketing is you're creating exposure and you're creating urgency. And, and those, two, those two ideas, when we start to think about exposure, we're trying to figure out this if we understand the housing market as an auction, and, and I don't mean selling houses as an auction, if we think about the dynamic as an auction, meaning it's a bidding market, it's not a market that's a retail market where you're gonna set a price and people are gonna come in and commit to pay the price. That's what happens in retail. And if they don't like your price, then you can bring the price down, but you don't get to negotiate. I don't get to go to the supermarket and pick up a T-bone steak and then haggle over the price when I get to the register. That's not the housing market. The housing market is a bidding market where our price is designed to create enough interest to start a conversation, but we negotiate back and forth. And so what we, and that's the way auctions work, right? We set a, enough of a, a good price and we've got an item of value that people want and the price is exciting enough that people start to bid and bid against each other and bid that price up. So marketing of a home is how we're gonna do that. And um, everything that we're doing to create exposure is about how do I get more people into the auction room, right? And we're gonna use all these different channels, right? I think I have a different slide here. Um, no, I don't see that slide here. Anyway, the point is all the different channels to get it exposed, online, social media, flyers, direct mail, all that stuff. What I want people to recognize, though, is that they are um, in competition. We're going to talk about this when we get to open houses a little bit later on this week. The thing that I didn't love about virtual open houses is what, what a lot of folks were doing is having a really good Matterport tour and allowing people to just go and walk through the house on their own. And the Matterport tours are beautiful, and they can give you a pretty good feeling for what the house is like. Nothing quite like actually getting in it. But, but the tours are good. 
The thing that I didn't always love is that not everybody was viewing the tour in, a, in an environment where people recognized that there were other people at the open house. A lot, I, and, I, and I heard by design that many people who were using um, Zoom to do a virtual open house were choosing to do it as a webinar and not as a meeting. And the reason being that in the webinar format, you didn't see who else was in the room. Well, I think that's a mistake. The purpose of an open house and why I'm happy we can open up public open houses again, and while we do have to manage crowd control in an era of posts, you know, getting back into this COVID environment is I want people to see that there's other people that want this house. I want there to be enough exposure and enough urgency that when they get there and say, oh my God, if I really like this, there's 19 other cars in line waiting to get in here. I better take action. I better take action quickly and I better be strong. I better not think that I'm going to come in here and steal a house, right? And so from the standpoint of marketing, we've got to make sure that what we're putting out actually creates urgency, meaning that the pictures have to be great. It has to be well staged, right? It has to be well staged. Let's talk about staging for a minute here, because I think it's a critical part of the marketing of a home. Probably, you know, I think what a lot of agents do is they, they tend to start thinking about staging as something that they do for their higher end properties, but maybe not something that they do for their lower end properties. And um, I get that to some degree, you have to do with what's in a budget, but I think, I think a lot of people miss in my estimation what the primary purpose is of staging. And let me ask you guys, when you're staging a home, what exactly does staging mean to you? What are we trying to do? What is, what is staging? Anybody? Somebody unmute and take a shot at that. Or in the chat box. I'll take a look at the chat box. What is staging? Kind of give an idea of the, to the buyers of the size of the space and how it can be utilized. So they get to see the space and see how they can utilize it, right? What staging allows people to do is to envision something that they might not recognize on their own, right? It's part of it. What else? Try to, uh, wouldn't you be trying to attract that home to the buyer, uh, getting a sense of identifying the trigger points for that buyer, which is a big challenge. But if you can stage the home to that. Okay. Here's, here's, yes, it's all those things. Here's what I'm thinking about in terms of staging. When I'm thinking about staging, I'm going to ask you this question. If I wanted to go into New York City, into a building that had a stage in it, where would I find a stage? Anybody, where could I find a building in, in New York City that has a stage? Broadway. Okay, Broadway. Now, is that you, Mr. H Hodak? Yeah, that was a question. What happens on that stage? Performance. Okay. A performance happens on that stage. And here's the cool thing that happens in a performance. When you go to the theater and you watch the performance, there's a psychological phenomenon that happens. It's called narrative transportation. Here's what narrative transportation is. Through the story, you personally become transported into the story. And it happens in reading a book. It happens in watching a movie. You know, when the, when the suspense builds up in the movie and you start to feel your chest tightening and your, your, your heart racing because you're pulled right into it. You're having an emotional reaction to what's happening. That's happening through the phenomenon of narrative transportation. And it happens through a performance. And what I want you to think about is how do we set up the house through staging, which doesn't just focus on things like color palettes, making sure that the trendy colors are in place, making sure that we've got good light, making sure that the house is clean and decluttered, all that's important. What I also want to do is I want to make sure that the home is configured in a way that there's almost little scenes, little scenes that people can stumble into and project themselves participating in an interaction, a little mini play, if you will, that's playing out in that space and being pulled into that scene so they have an emotional reaction, which hopefully is pleasant enough that they enjoy. Let me give you an example. It's not uncommon for people 
to put together in a living area a seating arrangement that has a couple of chairs, maybe with a table in between it, that's sort of a, a conversation area. And what I would do to stage that is I would kind of amp that up a little bit. I would actually put in, not just having those two chairs together with a table in between, but on that table, I might put uh, a bottle of wine and a couple of wine glasses and people, and maybe even a plate of cheese and crackers where people could envision sitting with a friend, having a glass of wine, having some cheese and grapes and enjoying that moment. That's staging. It's pulling people into a scene that says, this feels good. I like the way this feels. Kitchen staging, I'll go back to that for a second. Kitchen staging is way more than decluttering the countertops and getting all the greasy stuff out. Kitchen staging is maybe an open cookbook on the countertop with a cookbook that's open to a recipe of grandma's favorite chocolate chip cookies. And on the countertop would be maybe some ingredients out and some measuring spoons. And you could almost envision being in the kitchen with someone spending time together doing an activity of baking, right? That's a staging and it's different than what most stagers do. What most stagers think about is design. What I wanna think about is inviting people into an activity, staging for interacting, where you can have an experience with another person creates a different emotional experience than staging for a solo experience. Case in point, you go back to the living room. I could have chosen not to stage that conversation area. I could have chosen instead to stage a, a chair sitting by the fireplace with a book and a nice blanket over, or shawl over the back of the, of the chair and a, and a coffee pot and a cup of coffee where you could envision sitting by the fire, having a cup of coffee or a hot chocolate, reading a good book. That's also staging for an experience, but it's a solo experience. And experiences that you have by yourself don't create as big an emotional reaction as experience that you share with other people. And so I'm always thinking about how would I stage to create a prop, a scene where people could envision themselves interacting with someone else. A, 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 a game, a, 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 a Monopoly game left out, a jigsaw puzzle left out where you could picture coming in as a family and kind of working on the puzzle together. That's the kind of staging that I'm talking about, where you're, you, where you're trying to trigger that narrative transportation into a scene where people say, this would be fun. I would enjoy this experience. I would love to live in this house, as opposed to simply design. Do you see the difference? Do you feel the difference between those two? A lot of folks don't yes. think about staging that way. A lot of stagers don't think about staging quite that way. They think about it in terms of envisioning the utilization of the space, which is good. They think about staging in terms of creating a visually, aesthetically pleasing space, which is good, right? You don't want to walk into the lobby of a beautiful Four Seasons hotel and have bad smells and all that stuff. It has to be aesthetically pleasing. But to me, if you can put that layer on top of it, where you can set some props where people are interacting with other people and enjoying that experience, that's where staging to me is at its highest because that's the thing that causes urgency and exposure. If I know that there's other people that like this space and I can envision myself using it in a way that feels good with the people that matter to me, now I've got the highest level of urgency that I can leverage, right? So when you're marketing your listings, what you wanna start thinking about is how do you project that story? How do you project those visuals? You know, even think about, uh, you know, great bed and breakfast. There was a time when my wife and I were thinking about buying a bed and breakfast. I think I had watched way too many reruns of Newhart. But what happened was, um, you know, a lot of these B&Bs, if you go to these B&B catalogs, they'll stage these bedrooms, you know, with the great frilly, you know, duvet covers, and all that sort of stuff. But you're also going to see the breakfast and bed table on there. Well, nobody decorates like that. You're not going to you're not going to go to work and put the breakfast and bed table on there and, and come home and look at that and say, oh, isn't that fun? But you'll stage for that because if people walk in and see the possibility of having a nice leisurely breakfast in bed and enjoying that space in a different way, it's just a different experience, right? So as we wind down this section on marketing of the listings, what we're really starting to think of is how do you get the story out? What channels do you put out there? 
through social media, through print media, through uh, lots of different ways to get that story out there. And then once the story is out, how do you tell that story in a way that creates urgency? And how do you do it in a forum where people see that they're not the only ones with interest and start to trigger that sense, that fear of loss, right? Oh my God, this is wonderful. I've got to act before someone else gets it because I want it. Triggering the fear of loss is probably the most, uh, is, is the biggest part of marketing inventory. Is, is, is creating something out there that people want in the fear that they might not get it. You know, it's a marketing strategy that a lot of agents um, have a hard time really wrapping their head around and certainly a lot of sellers do. But I learned early on from, from a, a mentor of mine early on that if you can find a way to help the seller self-discover that you can't underprice a house, you really can't if you've got a great, if you've got a good home and you've got it well staged and you've got different channels to get it out in front of folks. You cannot set a price that's too low. What sellers are always afraid of is that if I put it out low, the market's going to come in and try to lowball me further still. That's not what happens. If you put it out just a skosh below what you think market value truly is, what the market does is they recognize immediately the value there and they rush to get it before someone else does. And they trigger that fear of loss. And then the market comes out and you start this bidding process. And, and we're already seeing right now that, that there's so many multiple bids going on. Uh, but that's, that's a strategic way of trying to trigger that market fear of loss to get the highest price to push its way through in the auction environment. If you start out at an auction with a price that the opening bid is so high that the room is not enthralled and we're going to start bidding at this paying for a hundred bucks. Everybody's like, eh, I don't think so. You're not going to have a good day. You've got to start out low enough that people can kind of get going and get the competition going. So those are the themes that we're going to talk about today. We're going to wrap up. It's quarter after 12. We're going to wrap up on those ideas, but the idea of marketing and prospecting is they work together. Marketing gives you a, an opportunity to market your brand. It gives you the opportunity to kind of, kind of prepare the soil. I'll use a garden analogy. My wife and I are, are gardeners and um, it's not uncommon. We've got a lot of perennials in the, in, the, in the garden landscape, but every year we go out and spend hundreds of dollars on annuals and you can spend lots and lots of money on annuals and put them into ground that's not prepared to receive them and those, those flowers don't do well. If you really want to have a good turnout, you've got you've to prepare the soil. And you do that with fertilizer and you do that making sure there's just ample drainage and all those things, right? Well, the marketing prepares the soil in your target marketplace for your action of planting. And in this case, your action of prospecting, right? The marketing prepares the soil for your prospecting. And it's synergistic that way. And your prospecting shows up in a way that's consistent with the story brand that you told in your marketing, right? And on the listing side, the marketing creates the urgency, the prospecting creates the urgency, and the marketing creates the, the exposure, right? And the prospecting creates the exposure. So those are the two things you want to talk about here in terms of how to kind of get those things kind of meshed together. We're going to wrap it up there. Um, give me a couple of questions or as Steve Gandell likes to say, questions, comments, jokes, or any ahas, anything that you'd want to share or anything we talked about today? The biggest aha for me was the staging and how you compare to Broadway and the feeling that you want to create. You know what? That I was hoping, Martha, that, that was going to be it because I am so passionate about staging. Here's what I know. I didn't stage well when I was actively selling. I hired stages. I knew it was important. I have the Y chromosome deficit, which is if the room is functional, it's good. Like I walk into a room and I'm like, chair, table, lamp, we're good. No, 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 no. That's not good, right? And I hired stagers and what stagers did that I couldn't see was design and aesthetic. I didn't see that. I liked it when I saw it. But when I really got that idea of staging as performance art, as a way of creating a scene that people can project themselves into to try to trigger a pleasing experience so they want that house even more, what we know is that logic gets people to think, but it's emotion that triggers action. If I want you to take the step of putting an offer on this, I've got to get your emotions involved And in staging for emotional experience is a really powerful way to do that. Try to think about as many different ways as you can do that, right? 
really good takeaway. I'm glad you thought that, that I'm glad that resonated with you. Anything else? Hal, I like the uh, Tim Heil reference, uh, the agent out of Austin, Texas, the nurturing concept, uh, sort of like, uh, like your garden, you know, you, you water it and it'll develop, but you have to keep uh, a certain number of touches, whatever you find is uh, adequate, you know, for that particular nurture, whether it's 36 or the 12. You know, it's funny because uh, as a coach, one of the things that I found is when I was working with folks and they were lead generating, it can get a little demoralizing because they don't automatically find appointments right away. And, and it's frustrating. And, and when that idea was, look, if I can get an appointment in my lead generation time block, that's a bonus. What I'm really looking for is, can I find people who will be willing to let me nurture this relationship over time? And if I build my database deep and wide enough, my systematic touches are going to make the appointments show up. The way I manage my pipeline and move people through the pipeline is going to cause the appointment to materialize. I'm not worried about the appointment. What I'm worried about is getting more nurtures into my database and let the systems do their thing. That to me was like mind blown when I heard that. I'm like, it makes all the sense in the world. And then your lead generation doesn't turn out to be feeling like a failure so much of the time because it's easier if you're adding value to people to find people who will be willing to let you stay in touch. All right. Good one. All right, guys, I think we're going to leave it there for today. We're going to come back on Wednesday and I believe we're going to get into working with the met portion of your database and doing specific marketing and prospecting to that inner inner core a little bit, I think is where we go next. All right. So if there's not any other questions, I'm going to wrap it up there and call the day. We'll catch you guys back up again on Wednesday. Sound good? Thank you, Hal. Take care, everybody. All right, guys. Thanks, be Hal. well. It's always a pleasure. Take care. Have a good Bye. day, Thank everyone. You. See ya. Bye.